Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 74. Uh, today's guest is Marjorie Lotfi. She's on the line from Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, we'll be with her in just a minute. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just, just do this because we love poetry. And if you love poetry as much as we do, please click the like button and share. And make sure you're subscribed and follow us on Facebook. Wherever you're watching this, there's something you can do to um, help help spread the poetry around the internet, which is what we want to do. We want to spread poetry around the world. And that's what we try to do every Tuesday with a new guest on the Rattlecast. Um, now, for the warm-up poem today, I just clicked the random button. And I think the audio is too quiet on this one. So I think I'm going to just read it myself. This is Joan Murray, The Witch's Daughter. And let's start out with that, just to get us into the poetry spirit. Here we go. The Witch's Daughter by Joan Murray. The witch we knew because she lived below the cliff we scrambled over. And she yelled ten times worse than anybody's mother. So the witch was the one we took everyone to see. First, we'd creep along the cliff edge soundlessly, then let out a scream of laughter. Oh, how the witch detested laughter. To her, it was a dog ripping out her throat, or a knife doodling in her gut, or the fat Monsignor sitting down and squeezing all her air out. But the witch's daughter never came out. The witch's daughter made herself invisible with a spell. Yet now and then, we'd see the pair of them walking together step by step, trying hard to look normal, step by step, putting one foot down and then the other, like everyone else on Ogden Avenue, till we couldn't stand it a second longer, and someone had to shout, Look out! It's the witch's daughter! And the witch's daughter! And we'd dive between two cars and hide for our lives. But sometimes in the hallway of the school, we'd see the witch's daughter without her mother, looking like any other kid, looking almost like us in her brilliant disguise of an ugly blue uniform, and even having a kid's name like the rest of us, till someone had to shout, look out, it's the witch's daughter. And then she would run, all the way home to her mother, where she could be as evil as a mountain, and as cold as the dark, and as, as invisible as a star. That was Joan Murray with um, The Witch's Daughter for medal number 42, our warm-up poem for today. And um, Joan Murray's most recent book, you can find her at joanmurray.com. That's J-O-N-M-U-R-R-A-Y. And her most recent book is The Swimming for the Ark, New and Selected Poems from White Pine Press. So find that at her website, joanmurray.com. And now let's move on to our guest today. Um, Marjorie Latfi, um, she's a frequent contributor to Poets Respond, and her most recent book is Refuge. She was born in New Orleans, spent her childhood in Tehran, then lived in San Diego, Washington, D.C., and New York before moving to London in 1999 and in Edinburgh in 2005. She founded and runs Open Book, which organizes reading groups in community settings and with vulnerable adults, and The Belonging Project, a creative writing project considering flight, journey, assimilation, and belonging alongside the experiences of refugees and immigrants. Her poetry examines journeys and questions of belonging, particularly relating to the experience of refugees and migrants. Refuge takes its starting point in 1970s Tehran, and in Iran on the cusp of revolution and explores ideas of flight, journey, and assimilation. And that's Marjorie Latfi, and uh, here she is. Hello, Marjorie. How are you doing? Hi there. Thanks for having me, Tim. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And, and the lockdown Scotland, unfortunately. And I heard, did, this, did they say it was going to last until March? Is that, I think it's a headline I saw. Is that the, Please is that the don't plan? Please do say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, we've, I think so far in Scotland, it's just till the end of the month. I think okay. they think in England, it might be middle of February, but I'm expecting them to extend it. So yeah, mm -hmm. we're all having lockdown blues here in Scotland. Today yeah. is the first day. So I'm yeah. wearing blue in honor of oh, the yeah. lockdown blues. <laughs> it started last night at midnight, right? Is that? Yeah. 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 So this is the first day. Um, and you've been, you were locked down before, right? In the, in the spring. So it's yeah, sort of the return we were of it. On, yeah. So I think, and they just, they, all along they've been saying they probably wouldn't lock us all down again. So they were working really hard to lock down different areas of the country um, rather than lock everybody down. But with this new variant, I think they don't have much of a choice as they roll out the vaccine. So, yeah, the numbers are, are better in Scotland, but I think the government's more conservative. So mm -hmm. so here we are. We're not we're not supposed to we're in. We're basically under house arrest. We're not supposed to leave our homes 
except for exercise and caring for people and other things. So it's an interesting time. It's quiet outside. Yeah. You can hear the birds. <laughs> all, all the poetry from the spring was about how you could suddenly hear the birds. Oh, yeah. We, we definitely had a bunch for Poet Respond in that, in that vein. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, but I'm so glad that the, you know, with the technology, we can still do poetry readings and things like that. It's an amazing, yeah. amazing thing to have in this, this difficult time. Do you want to start yeah. us out with a poem? I think you want to read, was it Gift you wanted to read first? Yeah, which is the opening poem for Refuge. And the background behind it is that when my mom, my mom's an American and my dad is Iranian. And um, when my mom arrived in Iran in the early 1970s with my dad, with the two of us, my brother and me, um, you could be forgiven for assuming that my devoutly Muslim grandmother would take some issue with this blonde, ten foot, five foot ten blonde Methodist wife of her first son. But in fact, she went out and bought her a crucifix and gave it to her when she arrived, saying, um, it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe in something. Mm -hmm. So I've taken her um, statement to my mom, which is always talked about in our house, and used it as the first line of every stanza in this poem. It does include a, a Persian tradition, which will come up later, so I'll explain it now, which is the practice of tarofing, which is the Persian tradition of always saying no to something that you're offered, even if you want it. So you have to say no two or three times before you're allowed to accept a cup of tea or a gift or anything else. So here we go, gift. It doesn't matter that she's blonde, doesn't know a single word of Farsi or how to tarof, always refuse first before accepting a gift. What you believe is your own trouble. Not one of us understands all the words of our mother tongue. Look at the eye, my father told me. Watch it speak. As long as you are here, I will be shelter. Believe in something. Your hands pressed together, palm to palm, are my body folded into the namas. Each of us maps ourselves in the mirror, measures what we already know. Beautiful. And that was the gift from Refuge, uh, Marjorie Lott Fee's book that came out, how, how many, is it two years ago or so? When did that come yeah, out? Yeah. It's been a couple of years now. And it's just a volume of just my Iran poems. So I'm going to mix up a few others tonight. But it was meant to be just a kind of reflection of our experiences in Iran and the family experiences in Iran. Yeah, could you sort of explain like your journey through, like just geographically, because it, it, it explained in that wonderful, I, my favorite poem in the book, I think, I just read it like an hour ago, is the, the long sequence about your father, which is so moving, but it sort of tells the whole story, but we're not gonna, I don't think, read that one today. So do you want to sort of give an overview of um, of what your life's journey has been like from yeah. from Ohio to Iran to just all <laughs> over the place, yeah. Yeah, so my dad, um, and the, the Pilgrim is, is the back end of that, and it was it was commissioned by the St. Magnus Festival, which is a music festival in Orkney, um, to be read in between some new uh, music that was commissioned uh, with the words of Rumi. So they wanted a kind of journey story that had Iranian connections. So I decided to kind of loosely write my dad's story, which is that he left Iran in the late 50s um, as an immigrant, um, a migrant really, trying to help support his family as the oldest of seven, and um, came to the US in the proper kind of American, um, you can do building your own dream story. And he put himself through college and then law school, met my mom. Um, and I was born in New Orleans because he was at Tulane Law School, which is the only law school in the country or the only state in the country that operates under civil law. So he could then hightail it back to Iran and practice law there. So I was born there, but then moved almost immediately after, and then spent my childhood in Tehran with this American mom who was teaching English at the University of Tehran and my dad. Um, and then when the revolution hit at the late 70s, it became less and less safe. And I'll, t I'll read poems about that for her, particularly as a blonde um, American. Mm -hmm. So we left and my dad wasn't able to come out with us immediately, but he came out the next year and um, we lost everything in that journey um, and had to start all over again. So yeah, we lived in California for a couple of years where we landed, where we had a lot of family. And then we ended up in Washington, DC, um, which is where I went to high school mm -hmm. and uh, 
junior high. And then, you know, in the way of good international families, my parents encouraged me to go and see the world. So I did. I went and practiced law myself, uh, which is a hard thing for a poet to admit, but I admit it. Um, have you done a, a, a tribute to lawyers Actually, yet? Actually, <laughs> last week's guest, Guy Jackson, is a lawyer too. And, um, and we okay. had issue 23, I think, was a tribute to lawyer poets. And there's a guy, um, okay. what is his name? He's, he has this... Um, anthology called the legal studies forum and if you look at it it looks like this like dry legal like thick brick of a book (laughs) and it's like got a green like legal studies forum title and then it's just poetry by lawyers once a year that he puts out i'm not sure if he's doing that he wrote an essay for us in the um in that in that um book so it's it's not that uncommon but um but a little uncommon it's a nice it's nice skill set to have as i was i was talking to this guy jackson but i wish i knew more uh lawyers who could help me with (laughs) some things (laughs) yeah it's a really interesting skill set to have though yeah so yeah so i practiced law in new york and london and then i had a family moved to scotland so um and then have started this charity which we might talk about a little bit too um which is a really interesting skill set to have a legal skill set in the what we call the third sector or the charity sector um so it, it makes for an interesting way to run an, an organization that's unusual. So, And then I started writing again. I was writing as a young person and in college, but I had stopped writing as a lawyer. So, yeah, and I'm still here. 20. So now I've lived in the UK longer than I've lived anywhere else, which I find a really strange thing. That only happened last year. So the, the balance is tipped. So I'm really interested in these questions of belonging because I still don't feel Scottish, and mm-hmm. I'm not sure I ever will. Um, so that's kind of, I'm interested in when you get to belong to, in a place yeah, or whether it ever happens in your generation. So, um, yeah, well, so that's my journey. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. Do you want to read another poem? Yeah, I thought I would, um, I'm going to loosely follow the experience of a, a migrant or a refugee tonight, but mm-hmm. so, um, the poems in the book start in on kind of living through a revolution as a kid. So I thought I would read the one that I, I don't think it was the first one, maybe the second one that you published, um, which was actually around um, police brutality with black men and when some of the riots were happening in 2014. And I was thinking about um, how having landed in Ohio, I didn't, I didn't include that. When we waited for my dad, we waited it out in Ohio where my mom was from how sometimes that prejudice is just inherent. You grow up with it and then you kind of have to unpick it. So I was thinking about that when I wrote this poem, which is the gun in its holster. It's responding to a beautiful sculpture, um, which is a rifle in a woods. It's in a sculpture park and you, you can be walking through the woods and think it's another tree, but in fact, it's a rifle that's about three stories high. Yeah, let me put this um, on screen for everybody just before we read, yeah. you read to get a sense of it. This is the sculpture here. A rifle on a tree. Imagine coming again on that in the woods. Um, as someone who hikes, you know, I hike all the time. If I, if I saw that, um, it really says yeah. something, doesn't it? It does. And the quite the problem is you walk past it. So you know, it's by a, an artist here by Cornelia Parker. Um, but you walk past it and you don't notice it. And I felt it said something about the way we carry generational um, prejudice, maybe, or something else. Anyway, the gun in its holster. The gun in its holster, like a rifle lent against a tree in a winter wood, is just waiting to go off. Look closely. Decoy paisley adorns the inlay, and one tear-shaped dropper points a warning from the side lock. When held, the trigger needs no convincing, no embellishment, is as familiar as the handle of that old hunting knife handed down from your father as your great-grandfather's one good thing. Yeah, I remember that ending. What a, what a wonderful ending to that poem. Um, Landscape with Gun and Tree was the uh, yeah. sculpture by Cornelia Parker, and that was The Gun and Its Holster by Marjorie Latfi, uh, published on Rattle December seventh, two 2014, so six years ago, very early on in um, yeah. the Poets Response series. That was the first year, maybe one of the 20 poems in or something like that. Um, yeah. Um, do you want to read another one? Yeah, I'll, I'll stick with this idea yeah. of kind of um, latent violence. So one of the things when we lived in Iran, in Tehran, during the start of the revolution, um, my parents, my mom refused to leave because my dad couldn't get out of the country. And she's brave, a brave woman and um, thought she was fine. Um, and so they took us to see, see lots of things, demonstrations, in the way that we might 
now even, I guess, in the U.S., although they tended to be more violent. But um, they took us to see, I think, what they thought was history in the making, and it sure was. It was just maybe not in the making that they thought it would be. Mm -hmm. Um, So this poem is called Shut Out the Noise, and it just takes its title from President Obama trying to pass a nuclear deal years ago and asking lawmakers to shut out the noise and just ratify the deal. Shut out the noise. Close your eyes. Cup your palms over your ears, then speak. Say, the day they shot all the doctors at the hospital for refusing to hide bodies, I was the girl watching from her grandmother's rooftop. Say, the staccato of sniper fire was a call to prayer, and the nightly track of tanks a low toll of bell, more pressure of sound than sound itself. Say, the fire at our school was set. Say, the man dressed in white robes walking our blacked out road after curfew asks the question without opening his mouth. Say, the words on every brick hurtled through our window. Yankee, go home. Yeah, and that was uh, Shut Out the Noise from Refuge. Um, I was wondering, just reading this book, how, you know, you were pretty young at the time. Um, I don't know how much, you know, how well your memory is, but but how um, sudden was the Iranian revolution? In the history books, like if you just read about it, it seems like it was sort of a surprise. That's how it's sort of like it came out of nowhere almost. And, and it wasn't expected to happen the way it did. W- was it something that like all of a sudden or was there's like a build up to it? Like what was the experience like? Like what was the feeling on the on the streets as it led up to it? I think, well, as a kid, you know, my memory of it is different. So I remember coming back from school one summer or some, from the States. We always went to Ohio in the summers and, and nobody was back. We went to a British school. So my parents wanted to be sure we could speak English. So we went to a British school. There was nobody, you know, none of the kids had come back from the States. So some there was much more of a sense on the ground of what was going to happen. So that was maybe three or four months in. But I think there was a real optimism in the way that there often is for revolutions. I think, you know, people thought, including my parents, that it would be a relatively bloodless shift, that it would be for a more moderate government. Um, they felt that there was a lot of corruption and a lot of poverty and a lot of imbalance in the society. And we were well off, relatively speaking, although it was a new generation of having made your own way rather than having been born into it. Um so I think people were actually quite optimistic, which is maybe why my parents took us to see things, because mm-hmm. they thought that, that things would happen well, you know, and sort of, so, yeah, I think it, and my grandparents had come to visit us not long before from Ohio, which is an interesting experience um, for them. So I think, yeah, I think it was fairly sudden in the sense of months, not years. And I think there was a growing sense of injustice, mm-hmm. which most people believed in, you know, most, yeah. most middle class people believed in. And, um, so what, that was, it, was, I think the shock was that it, they didn't get what they wanted. Yeah, to. yeah. W- was it more about the um, Western influence on the, on the Shah, um, or was it more about this, the Shah being like a monarch and, and the corruption that level? When you, when you say justice, yeah. what was the justice about? It, I think well, my memory of it mm-hmm. and what, my, you know, what I would have heard was that, that there were, the, yeah, that the monarchy was really wealthy and, and quite frivolous in that wealth in a way when there was real poverty about. So... I think it was that imbalance and less about maybe I think people felt that he was a straw man for the West mm-hmm. um, in terms of oil, not in terms of much else. I don't think there was any concern or, you know, my mom was not where not covered. She was obviously during the revolution, but she, for years wasn't for most of our time there wasn't covered. And it was a real Western time. You know, you would go to the beach and women were in bikinis and it was totally fine. Mm-hmm. I don't think there was a real feeling of problem with that. It was more about the poverty, the kind of relative imbalance in society. And most people wanted to see it fixed. Yeah. So that's, I think they got a shock because that's a great time, as we know, as we saw for, um, yeah, a religion to take hold, for maybe fanaticism to take hold. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But as a child, I think I was the perfect balance of young enough to not be afraid and old enough to remember. So my brother, who's a few years older than me, doesn't remember very much at all um, and would have been very aware of how in danger we were um, in the various situations. And I just wasn't, you know, um, which was useful. Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
Um, well, since this is so you know thematic, let's do more poems. There'll be time too for questions from the audience. So if anybody has any questions for Marjorie, um, leave them in the chat window, and I'll pass them along about poetry or about her life and, and this journey that she's been on. Um, but but let's let's sort of tell the story too through poetry, and, and then we'll we'll do more time for questions and and, and all the other things you do, which are just incredible. Um, as we go farther into the episode. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, well, the next couple, I can't remember what I'm reading after that. Oh, yeah. So I'll read a couple words were about us getting out of Iran. Um, so the day we left, mom, um, and I think we were at school. Dad turned up in the middle of the school day and said, um, it's time to go. They had been, mom had not wanted to be leaving, and dad had been kept trying to encourage her to take us away because it wasn't safe. So in the end, he said, that's it, you've got to go. The airports are shutting, the city's on fire. It was a kind of notorious riot happening in town. And he'd bought us tickets for a flight out, just three, and said, that's it. And we went home for the passports. Um, and on that journey, which is, we'll talk about it, I'm sure, how, where the belonging project really came from in many ways. My mom said to my brother and I, right, um, you can take one thing. Think of what it is. Mm -hmm. Think of where it is in the house. And, um, and then when we arrive, you have to go get it. But the, it has to be able to fit on your lap on a plane. And you have to be able to carry it yourself because I need to go for the passports and a, a suitcase of belongings. And we did that. And then we turned and went straight for the airport. And then... And this next poem is about that journey through that riot, through a very big, famous riot to get to the airport. My mom was covered in the back seat as trying to hide the fact that she was an American. Um, and it was notorious for lots of reasons, but specifically because two women died in that riot um, and they were reported as having died, which was really unusual in Iran for them to be out protesting and then for, their, for that to be reported at all. So that comes through in this poem. It also references a Persian holiday, which is called Shahar Shambay Suri. It's a bit like, well, it's a bit like bonfire night here in Britain. It's um, lots of, it's really fun. It's a bit like 4th of July. It's the night before the new year. Okay, to the airport. She wraps a black scarf around her white face the way her mother-in-law does, has shown her when the car edges towards Shayed Square. Do not look into the eyes of men. No voices, just a roar, and the bird song of gunfire in winter sunlight slouched down the well of leather seats yielding, diminishing her height, a dead giveaway, this, the mother of all riots. Speak only Farsi. Kamran, almost eleven, already tall beside her, knows they aren't coming back. His fingers gripping her leg like a toddler still. He blocks the view, the window, the streets full, guards, protesters, her English students. Lower your eyes, hide any color. Her hands layered with rings. The faces of her jewels turn inwards towards the palm. One hand slipped under her thigh, the other held by Batman. Her husband, this rare gesture, his goodbye. Eight year old Marjorie up front with Mahmad, a Pollyanna, dark eyes open, pointing out the green crests of placards, the burning effigy, a bonfire for Chahar Shambay Suri, the cusp of Nauru's, two pretty headscarves, purple hyacinths, still closed, floating down a dark river. Yeah, things that was to the airport. Um, let me ask, I was going to ask, um, since it's not in the poem, what was the one thing that you brought with you? So it's in the next poem. Oh, is it? Okay. Um, I, was a, I was a kid who collected all sorts of, as a mom of four now, I know what it's like to mother a child like this, collected everything, stones, feathers, rocks, you know. Um, I had little collections of everything, so I couldn't bear to leave those behind. So rather than taking my precious doll, I emptied my lunchbox and put all my treasures in my lunchbox. So I took my lunchbox. Um, That's smart. So the next... <laughs> yeah. like, like wishing for more wishes or something. Yeah, exactly. I felt like I could yeah. cut in you know, all my little um, um, erasers and tiny pencils and mm -hmm. whatever. I don't have any of those things, but I do still have the lunchbox. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and the next poem is really about that and a few other things that happened on that journey. But it came out of rage from... Um, Something that you can still find on the BBC website, which is, it's almost like a game. It's called The Syrian Journey, Choose Your Escape Route. 
And you go on site and you can like push buttons and you can make decisions. Like it, it, it's supposed to mimic what it's like trying to get out of Syria or, or would have been years ago when that crisis was first on the foreground, for forefront of people's minds. So you could choose whether you're going to go by land or by sea and how much to pay the smugglers. And at the end of the game, there's no other word for it, um, you worked out whether your family lived or died. Wow. Um, and I, uh, having had a relatively easy journey out um, relative to most people that I've met since then, of Iran and other places, I really take issue with this idea that you can sit in the warmth of your home and click buttons and figure out, oh, that's interesting, or learn anything really about what it's like. So this um, I wrote in a rage, so be warned. Um, and I should say when we got on the plane, we had no radar on the plane. The government had stripped the radar out so that the flight wouldn't go, but the pilot went anyway, oh, and wow. it's referenced in here. So it's called Root. There was the game of counting gunshots in a riot and buying cigarettes for our two blonde mother, the game of the school set on fire while we were still in it and counting the minutes until the return of my brother. There was the game of one toy for the journey, taking my lunchbox and filling it instead, the game of hiding mother on the way to the airport, father at the barrier when we went ahead. There was the game of turning your ring inwards and giving it to the man at the gate to let you pass. The game of finding your seat on the flight, counting those standing in the aisles who got on last. There was the game of rising too far through the cloud, then descending again over the border. The game of picking a runway and landing, our radar stripped out so we wouldn't make it over. So... That was my angry poem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was uh, that's a. It's just this whole book is just such a, an incredible story and, and so well told, really through poems in a in a in a sequence. How did you um, end up as a? You, you mentioned um, when we were talking before that you're writing fiction now. Um, how did you end up? Yeah. You know, going from from a lawyer to writing writing poems. How how did that how did that journey? It's a separate journey. How did that journey happen? Um, it went the other way. I did poetry and, as an mm -hmm. undergrad and, and did enough um, English classes to have a double major in, in English and really creative writing and poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have two parents who are lawyers, uh, oh, okay. eventually, who convinced me that a PhD in poetry wasn't going to get me where I wanted to go in life and that a law, law school would be a good um, way to go. So, yeah, it was, and, and now I'm back at poetry. So it's really having come back to it rather than the other way around. I've always loved it. And, and what drew you to poetry? Like what, like when did you start writing and, and, and why? Do you, do you know? You know, in that Lutchbox of Little Books with, um, that I was making at BH of Eight, which with just, they, I wouldn't call them poems, but little observations. I don't know. I think I've always thought the power of language mm -hmm. to connect people or observation is interesting. Mm -hmm. It's definitely the thing I've always gone back to in a crisis or not. You know, even as a lawyer, I, I didn't write. I just carried poems around with me. Um, yeah, I was so, wondering, because uh, in the in the long poem about your father, there's a, a, a part where he, you know, since he speaks different languages and wasn't the master of either. And so I was wondering yeah. if, um, you know, if there was some kind of influence there to sort of fulfill that that wish that your father had to... Um, sort of fit within a language is that had anything to do with with love of poetry um i think n no but i think i probably because i don't speak farsi very well anymore or in fact I, I really don't speak it i understand it but it was my first language so people sometimes tell me i write poetry like english is my second language which i think is interesting or that my turn of phrase is slightly different mm -hmm. um and I think it's probably because I'm stuck slightly between, uh, certainly between British English and American English now. Oh, yeah. um, and so I think, it, yeah, so I'm interested in that. Um, and I'm really interested in narrative poetry. So one of the criticisms I get, and you'll know this, Tim, is that, that my poems aren't poems, that they're stories, that they're fiction. Um, so I, I object to that most of the time. <laughs> yeah, we, we object to that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think there's, yeah, I'm really interested in the power of being able to tell a story. And so that's where the Belonging Project came from, is the use of telling. And that's probably where this pamphlet came from, too, is the use of telling a story. So I definitely have an immigrant's mentality, which is what's the point of fill in the blank? You know, I don't necessarily do things just for their own sake, um, which I 
it's foolishly maybe think that's the, the that's the that's the category or that's the realms of people who haven't lived through trauma or it, it's a gift to be able to do something just for joy mm-hmm. um but i think i always am thinking what's the point in what's the point in this pamphlet and for me the point is to try and give people a sense of the the subtlety of difficulty maybe of not being from one place or the other and how you carry that with you i guess i don't really know um, and poems do that. I just think poems give you a sense of what it's like to be in a different way than stories. Um, they they have gaps. So we talk about this in the charity that I run a lot too. Poetry has huge gaps. And the bigger the gaps for me, the more the reader, and I'm talking about as a reader, not, not as a writer now, mm-hmm. um, they give you a chance to step into them um, and draw you in for me. So, and that's what's magic for me about poetry, reading poetry. And when we work with the charity, I run, I run works with all kinds of different people, lots of refugee and migrants, but prisoners and people in hospitals and people living in domestic violence situations and things. It's those gaps that you can talk about and every, and you work out that everybody in the room has a different view of what's happening in those gaps. So for me, that's why poetry is magic in a way that a story doesn't always give you a gap Mm -hmm. for me the best ones do but poetry almost always does if it's working it was doing its job so yeah um, it it feels to me like um you know poetry is the most intimate kind of of the arts because you're you know the the poet's voice becomes your voice and there's this sort of um i don't know it's like they're little empathy machines that really that really make it so you feel what it was like to feel because because there's something about storytelling and voice where we like embody and in, in, in mm-hmm. i don't know it's, a, it's more than a an account would be in prose i think poetry just connects in that way and lets you experience an experience that that other people haven't had which is what i love about it too i just love reading poems and hearing other people um you know their stories it's really a kind of storytelling where you get to be yeah. that that intimate with somebody um and that might be a good segue to talk about the the two um the projects you do, um, open door yeah. or open books. I keep saying open door, sorry. And, um, okay. and, um, and the belonging project, um, how did those start and, and what are they? Can you explain a little bit about what you do? Yeah. So open book is what I'm working on full time belonging project. I'll just say something about, but it's, it's a couple of years old. So the belonging project came out of this idea that, um, it was really at the start of the refugee crisis here, maybe five years ago. Um, and there was an awful lot of anti-migrant refugee sentiment around. And people would say, oh, no, not people like you. We don't mean people like you. And I, um, and people were always surprised to hear that I'd had this experience as a child. Um, and so I started writing about it, partly to say, no, no, you're talking about people like me and my dad and my grandmother and other people who have... Um, who have value, you know, who have brought huge amounts with them and contribute in things. And that's the often the view of migrants is that they don't. Um, and so I used, the plan with that was to use my own story, which you're hearing a lot about tonight, um, really as a tool um, to ask people to do a bit of writing themselves. So they were in prisons and schools. I was working with young people then too, telling that story of leaving and having one thing, choosing one thing. And when it's your own story, at least... It ha- it's not it's not a terrible story in the sense of lots of people coming across some dinghies and things. But because I it was the only story I felt I could tell, um, I could ask kids, what would you bring? You know, and let's talk about it. And why don't you write me something about it? And also, I would carry around a suitcase and then also say, well, okay, well, what can you not get in this suitcase? And that's quite an that's a much more interesting question. Um, what are the views out your window? What's the food that you would take with you if you could? What's the chippy sauce, apparently, in Edinburgh? It's really important. Um, but, you know, it was a great way to learn about Scottish culture, too. But um, a lot of it was just asking people about what they would choose to take. And also, if they couldn't decide, writing about that process of trying to decide was really interesting. And then what they couldn't fit in the suitcase, which was really about sights and smells and large objects and other things, people. Um, and then just asking them about what, how long it takes to belong to a place. What does it feel like to belong? to a place and I had very specific writing prompts to mm-hmm. do that so that project was probably 75 workshops across Scotland just just in schools and with prisoners and, and prisoners were really interesting um, because those guys they were all lifers really um, so they were guys who were never leaving mm-hmm. and and largely I should say many of them anti-migrant um, but then when you started talking about them and talking about your story and telling them and asking them questions at the end of the process of that project with a particular group, they said, you know, we have so much more in common with migrants than we would expect because we've all had to leave home and pack something very small and learn a new language and settle into a new community, you know, a kind of different kind of language within these walls. 
So it was a really interesting, good project, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to bring it back um, as things change um, and we keep seeing more and more migrants. So that was a good project to do. The Open Book is um, a charity that I started in 2013 with another lawyer friend, and that charity just runs reading groups and um, reading and creative writing groups. And they're a bit like a book group that we would all go to and know, but you don't do any reading ahead of time, which is great for people like me who never finish the book in their book group. Um, so the idea behind this is you turn up and you do all the reading together, and then the rest of it's just like a normal book group. And about half of them now, a third to half of them tackle on creative writing. And the magic behind that is you don't have to be able to read. Hmm. You don't have to be able to see. Um, you might English might be your second language. You might just have a bad relationship with literature or text. So in places like prisons, we're in we're in a stroke unit in a hospital. Um, if you're elderly and are struggling with your sight, or even your hearing but not your sight, you can end up with people in a room who can connect. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a really it's an accessibility project. Um, and then what happens in those groups is that people turn up and they don't have to talk about themselves. So that's secretly a kind of loneliness project, I would say, and we are using literature as a tool for making, helping people make connections and build communities without having to bring their laundry to the room and talk about themselves. And we're in prisons and in hospital settings in lots of community projects with refugees and migrants. We're running about 1,500 sessions this year across Scotland from the islands off the most northerly islands with communities that don't get very much to, um, all the way west, all the way east. So in 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 Gaelic, my my baby this year will be to start a group running book sessions or reading sessions in Arabic. Oh, wow. um, you know, just trying to serve communities really to help build communities. So that's what that project. So, so how does it work? Um, you know, not have reading the books ahead of time. Is it is it poetry that that you're always reading? So it's short enough, or is it like? Is... <laughs> well, you know me, so of course we <laughs> always have to read poems in every session. Um, but usually it's a piece of fiction, short piece of fiction, um, which is followed by a poem. Mm -hmm. So if we're reading a short piece of fiction up to a thousand words, uh, it, it'll be paired with a poem or two that's thematically linked in some way. And the poetry really draws people out in different ways. Mm -hmm. And again, like what I was saying, and you'll know yourself, um, if it has gaps in it, all the better, because people disagree or they'll say, well, this is this father's different. No, this father's the same as the father in the story. So it's just a, something to set off against it. Um, yeah, and we're in care homes, we're in all sorts of places. It, and what it does is just give people a chance to, lots of people who, particularly in prisons, again, going back to prisons, a lot of those guys don't read or won't read. It's a mix. Um, but it means that in my group, for example, I ran a, whole, a group for a whole year in a prison. There was a guy who was studying for his, his college degree, effectively, for English, and one who never finished school and wouldn't read. I don't know whether he couldn't read, but he would never pick up the text. And they were able to read Raymond Carver together and talk about it, which is a really magical thing, I think, because the one guy was saying, this is the first time I've willingly engaged with anything literary or lit he wouldn't call it literature, a book in my whole life. Um, whereas the other guy did it all the time, but it meant they could meet. It's very sort of leveling, this model. So, um, yeah, so now it, having started just running them sessions myself because I wanted to get back to literature, I might just now run the, I run the charity because we're so busy in all these different places. But it's a great thing to do. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. But I assume you, you, there's no way you can run all those workshops. So it must become a sort of way of, um, you know, recruiting and training people to, to start them themselves. Is that how it functions? And how many, like, workshop, you know, leaders sort of do you have? Does each workshop have its own leader? Or are there people who go around and do this um, all yeah. the time? No, so we have... We have um, about 75 people mm -hmm. who work with us. The, the largely the ones that are just reading together are volunteers who lead it. So we train them, we PVG them, which is the kind of police checks. Um, we give, make sure they have all the resources they need. We provide, um, at, at the moment, because all of our sessions are online, um, we provide materials thematically um, every month so that you they can all link in a nice way. We have a writer in residence who will write us material on that theme and things. So it all links up beautifully. Um, and then the creative writing ones, which started really out of my work with refugees. Um, those, those are all funded positions for writers and they're writers of a particular standard that's kind of qualified within Scotland. Um, and what they're doing is, and it's an interesting thing, and maybe I should read one of the group's pieces of work. Um, what I found is when I was working with refugee and migrants, if you put a poem in front of them, they would talk about it 
and they would pick it apart and say, excuse me, what is, what does this mean? What does, you know, God mean or whatever? And they would translate it. So it was, it was an English exercise as well as a poetry exercise. Um, but then if I asked them about their own experiences, we were reading a poem about spring, say, and I would say, okay, but what does, po- what does spring mean to you in Syria? And someone would say, oh, it's washing the windows or, oh, we're, the woman from India used to always say, we are waiting for the mangoes in spring or whatever it was. And so the job of the writer is to take all that language at, at the moment and create a poem um, from the w- words of the people in the group. So a lot of those groups are running um, group poems mm-hmm. effectively. So you never have to pick up a pencil, but you can be a writer, which is really nice. And then that work gets published um, in lots of the journals in Scotland and by some of our larger organizations. And we publish them too. We publish them in a pamphlet every year. So it might be nice. Will I read one of the poems? Yeah, from please the do. I have the... the um... Yeah, yeah, new beginning. Yeah, yeah. I'm just finding it here. I think I stuck it at the back, and I think I sent you a picture of the ladies. Yeah. So this is the, this is the ladies of the Mary Hill Integration Network, yeah. um, which is, uh, not all of them are willing to be in the picture. So that's a raucous group of usually 25 or 30 oh, wow. women, um, in a room. It's really noisy, and it's fine if you're a Middle Easterner. You're used to people talking over you and stuff, um, and they're from every continent: Africa, the Middle East. Yeah, Europe, everywhere, everywhere. So I'll just read this. Um, Yeah, I'm sure sure you can see it. New beginning. That time we all heard it, a song at the river, sharp stones under rain on the trees. We sang, lay down, sister, the last time we sang. We put the song into many languages. We had so much power. One woman fell and we lifted her up. We sang for the tired leader, like us, she needs to rest, slow time, breathe into the present, walking, praying, wading in the water, carrying this vision of hope, roses, the unknown. Yeah, that was New Beginning, a wonderful poem, a group poem written in in one of the um, belonging project workshops, right? Or was this open? No, this is open book. Open book. Yeah, this is open book. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's such a wonderful, I mean, that, I love what you said about, um, you know, loneliness and what, because um, I feel like we're just culturally, we don't have the same, just anybody has the same connections that we used to with the, the way mm-hmm. the world works. And then for, for people who are coming to a new country, it must be so much, you know, magnified um, compared to that. Um, yeah, I think in my experience of that as a child, and that's what I'm writing that sort of fiction memoir about is how your inclination is to forget that and become, especially in America, become an American, you know, just fully embrace it, um, which is great. But I think, and we expect migrants and refugees to do the same. We expect them to be grateful and to um, just to take on the culture of where they've landed. And that's a good thing. But what I'm finding is that if you ask people, they're bringing riches with them, you know, of their own cultures. And it, what, what we're trying to do with Open Book is articulate that to them that what they are bringing with them not in terms of materials but in terms of their culture and their values and their histories matters and that we want to hear it we want to write it down and that the rest of the world as an organization we can help get those voices out there um and show them that other people want to hear it too you know it's not just yeah us. It's us yeah too. are there are there individuals in in these uh, groups that um you know take on writing sort of a lot and and write a lot and are publishing a lot is there sort of a yeah so Mina in that group is now, mm-hmm. she, she went from being a part of a relatively quiet part of that group, and I'm pretty sure she's in that picture, um, to writing a lot of her on her own. She's a translator, um, and, uh, and now has, we are publishing her work on her own, her own work as well. And she's now turning up at other workshops that we do writing on her own. So there is definitely a progression. Another woman, Safana, was a teacher in Syria and is now translating, and she's now translating children's books and turning up at events and translating on the spot as well. So, and doing her own writing in English as well as in Arabic. So yeah, I think it's all a journey, but we're we're trying to be part of that journey too. Mm-hmm. Well, um, do you want to go back to uh, reading po- your own poems again? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'll do a couple of kids' poems. They're not really kids, but they're about kids. Okay. Um, and I think I'll skip, I'll skip this one, but I'll maybe read Sunflower, which is a poem that I wrote. Um, people always ask me what I brought. And in the belonging workshops, I never tell people about the lunchbox because mm-hmm. if you tell kids, that's what they'll do too. They think it's a great yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but it's amazing what people did bring with them when they left places like 
all sorts, all places all over the world. Things like spices or garden seeds or other things, just because it's amazing what you grab when you don't have very much time. Um, and this was this image of, for me, of uh, someone taking garden seeds, sunflower seeds specifically. So sunflower. Her grandfather always said that everything she'd need was beneath the gray of its shell. The signposts of winter would come from its height, the strength of its spine, how long it resisted before nodding its head to wind. When she left, she took nothing but the seeds, their rattle in the tiny tin better than money. No one else would know the shade of soil for planting, want flocks of birds for friends. Now, she sleeps with them under her pillow where they grow into her dreams, stakes to lean against on each crossing, and wakes picking at yellow petals tangled in her hair. Um, and I'm just going to follow that straight on with the poem that I wrote for Rattle, which is about a little girl in a camp in Gaza. Um, and I think, I don't know if you can show the image too, but it's a beautiful picture that just caught my eye of a little girl running through um, a refugee camp in Gaza, Burij, Gaza. Yeah, I can show that. This is um, a Palestinian girl carries a child across rubble from a building that police said was destroyed by an Israeli airstrike in the um, Burij refugee camp in the central Gaza Strip, August 1st, 2001, 2014, courtesy of Reuters and Finbar O'Reilly was the photographer. So... Uh, we credit and, and uh, it's fair use if we do all that. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, great. Perfect. Picture of girl and small boy. I would like to tell her not to wear such flimsy shoes. That rubble contains the whole spectrum of knowable and unknowable dangers. Sheets of metal ripped to nice edge, live wires bloated arms still reaching for light. Her hair scraped back into a ponytail is open to sky. Remnants of buildings filter down one concrete chunk at a time, and the midday bells of rockets ring out above her. She carries a boy on her still narrow hips, his legs entwined around her life jacket yellow dungarees. Like a rodeo rider, his left arm grips her shoulder to steady himself or her, while torso recoils back and away. His body is asking to slow down, to turn back. Instead, her eyes comb the ground for a next step, fingers of her free hand curled into a claw, as if to frighten off whatever is coming what she somehow knows is ahead. Yeah, that, that's just an amazing photograph. Um, great for, for an ekphrastic poem and, and so powerful and a powerful poem to go along with it too. I still remember when you submitted that for the first time and, and then looking at this photo and uh, just amazing work. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for publishing it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, our pleasure. And that was in Poets Respond, uh, if anyone wants to find it again, August 10th, 2014. Oh, that's even further. That's, this is the first one of yours that we published yeah, then. Yeah, that was like one. a month after we started Poetry Respond. Yeah, and I set myself at a challenge of writing one every week for a while, just as you probably got tired of reading them. No, but. I never, never do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was a really good challenge as a yeah, writer. Yeah, too. well, I'm grateful to the people who send every week because then we definitely have good stuff every week. Otherwise, you know, when we started, my fear was that we would not have a poem some week and I'd have to like... What do I do? Do I write my own fake one really quick and pretend? Or something? <laughs> so, but that's never been a problem. Ask you if you have a pen name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it's never been a problem. Which is just that. But that was the nervousness about about doing the series. Um, but there's always stuff worth publishing, and and several from you. So thanks for contributing yeah. to that. Well, and, and the next poem I'm going to read, I actually wrote for a Poets Respond as well. Um, so I'll just read it. But it's, it, it was, you didn't pick it, <laughs> which was fine with me. But um, it, was, it was when the North and South Korea border opened for a little while. And I can't remember when it was. Um, it reminded me that I have this story in my family, too, where my great-great-grandmother was marched across the border when the borders were shutting during the Bolshevik uprising in 1917 from Azerbaijan into Iran. And she left behind a, um, a daughter. She had a few children, so she was taken by one daughter, but left behind a daughter um, who was her favorite daughter. 
And even though there was only 150 miles between them, she never heard from or saw that daughter again. And my dad's memory of her is um, her marching around the back garden, having really lost her mind with grief. So I thought I would write her poem in her voice. But it was a poet's respond poem. Um, Chonum, which means Mrs., which was her name. I am not interested in Bolsheviks. Instead, it's the way light fell across my daughter's sleeping face. How she ate pomegranate, mouth brimming with tiny jewels. The way her nostrils would flare at the sight of mulberries. But when offered, tar roofing, she'd eat. Like swallows, we migrate. But there's no spring and no autumn in this place. Along with the samovar and the jannamas, I was walked from Baku across the border, 150 miles, a distance I measured in the steps it would take to return. Now in Tabriz, my grandson skips into the courtyard where I spend daylight wearing a path around the lilting fountain, speaking to the birds. He sits next to me under the mulberry tree and listens before asking if he can send a message back home too. Another beautiful poem from Refuge. Um, did you say Hanum? Is that how you pronounce it? Hanum. Hanum. It's kind of stuck in your throat. Yeah, yeah. yeah Hanum. Hanum. Okay. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, I Let's see. We should do some more questions from the audience. Um, but I was wondering, as I look for that, um, you know, you... A lot of the poets we talk to, um, their sort of writing process is to sort of look for sort of mystery and find um, like what they want to write about and stuff like that. And you've already described like you have a purpose with your writing, which is to tell a story. Um, how do you think that that changes your process? And, and just in general, what's your process like? Like, how do you how do you identify something that you want to write about? And then and then what do you do once you have yeah, so these stories are all stories that I want to tell, but often it's, um, I think I am driven by narrative poetry, actually, because I, I, the other poets, poetry that I write about is, is sort of sea poetry. It's quite often a stories about the sea on the western part of Scotland, or I do a lot of workshops for the National Library of Scotland and the amazing archives they have. And for me, they're always suggesting stories, so I'm always wanting to embody a voice. Um but I think it's probably like every poet, you know, and I'm sure I've read it in an interview with you before, Tim. It's like there's something about, there's like an itch. There's mm-hmm. something about something that's interesting. And you, for me, I can never articulate what it is um, until I start writing about it. And then I'm just writing around it and mm-hmm. something comes out of it. So for me, it would have been that image of the girl and me thinking, why is that interesting? Probably because she looks too young to be carrying that boy. You know, and for me, I had children that age mm-hmm. at the time and thought, holy moly, if that was my kids, what would I say? You know, um, but I, I probably didn't know that before I wrote it. I just started writing about it. So yeah, my process is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> or probably like every other poet's process, which is to have an itch and then scratch it or try yeah. and scratch it. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, you know, because po- some people, every time I say, you know, something like that, that there's an itch that poets are all searching after, uh, there's always pushback. There's, no, it's not always like that. So I'm always trying to find somebody who it's not like that for. But, but it seems like everybody has a different entry point into into entering that space which is sort of the trying to make sense trying to put order in the world of chaos is kind of what we do as artists you know and even if it's your narrative storyteller and you're finding the stories that have that sort of mystery that you're that you can't quite put together and can't quite put your words around you know and then you and then you find a way to and that's what you're doing so i'm always happy to hear it when it's uh, the same (laughs) process because that's my theory anyway and um i like it when it holds up (laughs) Yeah, it, it it definitely does. And I think for me, the question of wanting to tell a story is a question now and that I'm really privileged about whether I publish the poem. So, you know, if it's a story that I don't feel like I can tell yet, and there's a fair number of those, or I feel I, it's a voice I shouldn't take on for some reason, or I feel I'm not quite there yet. I just, there's a, like everybody, I've got drawers full of poems that are not going anywhere okay. yet. Um, not because they're not necessarily poems that I like, but for some reason, you yeah, know, so I, um, I'm not publishing them. And I think it's, or not that we all get to choose where we publish our poems, but I'm not even sending them anywhere. Mm-hmm. So I think partly that idea that there are there is a reason to send, to have published these poems was a choice to pub- publish them rather than necessarily, I'd already written them all. Mm-hmm. 
Um, it was just a question of, yes, is this a good thing to do? Does this arc of stories help anybody else in any way, apart from making me feel great about being a poet? Um, yeah. So hopefully the answer is yes. Well, I don't I'm know sure that it does, and I'm really glad that you did. Um, a lot, along the same lines for, for how you go about writing, um, Joseph Calderon asks, if, is your poetry mostly inspired by direct observation pulled from journaling? Like, like do you go somewhere to write and, and, um, and, or do you just journal and then you pull your notes out into poems? How, how, does, how do you actually get there? I wish I was that organized. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I did for a while have a list of things that I kind of story, family stories that I felt I should write about. But often they're the same stories, you know, and I'm coming at them a different way and I'm learning something new about, you know, I'll think I'm not done with the fire in the school, for example. And, and there's, a, there's another poem in this about having arrived in the U.S. and then having to go through Cold War drills, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was amazing for a child who lived through a revolution where your school was actually set on fire. Um, so sometimes I think I'm not done. I'll have written it into a poem and I think, no, there's something more to be said. I wish I was really organized and had journals. One can wish for that, but maybe because I'm working full time and I've got four kids and yeah, maybe someday <laughs> I'll have to be able to do that. But no, I wish I had a better process. Um, and now I quite often write in my own workshops. I was saying to Tim before we started, that's often when I get a, a chance. So I just choose things that inspire me so that I will be inspired to write about them too. But um, yeah, I don't really have a process. It's an itch. There's something, there's mm -hmm. something, but even sometimes it's a turn of phrase, you know, that I'll just pull over and type it into my phone because there's something about it that I think is, there's something in there, but I'm never sure what it is. Uh -huh. So um, there's an interesting question. Richard Westheimer asks, um, do you hear the music of Farsi when you write? Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. And I often want to put more Farsi into the poems, not direct speech necessarily mm -hmm. or full sentences, but the language, you know, even in that last one, I can, you know, having chosen Jannam as it was for the kind of abruptness of the word. So for me, I'm definitely choosing to use the Farsi when it, there's something musical about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You say it better than I do. There's something <laughs> musical about it. Yeah. And there is a fair bit of Farsi in the, in the long sequence that Tim referenced to, yeah, just just words that I feel like say something more than the English translation would. Do you ever uh, think about translating? Because you know, it'd be great to have more Farsi poems in English. Um, is that something you've? you've... My, no, my <laughs> Farsi is terrible. Um, so I need to learn Farsi properly. And I've just met a great woman in Edinburgh who's Iranian, who's an incredible cook, which is really the most important thing. But apart from that, she's also directed me to a. Um, and a Farsi school. So I need to pick up my Farsi again before I think I would feel confident enough to, but I wish I could, yeah. Well, just to let you know a secret, I think a lot of translators don't speak the language very well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like A.M. Jester was on here and he translates poems in like eight different languages and he does not speak eight languages. <laughs> so, well, that makes me feel better. Maybe, so, yeah, maybe there's like something he in it. He's taken some classes in certain languages and things and then and then digs in. So, um, I don't, and that can be a way to learn, you know, to get back into the language too, yeah. I think, so. Sorry, just trying to encourage I, um, you because I'd love to see it. I I do um, often. There's a whole poem in here which I meant to read, which is about my my Iranian grandmother giving the only bracelet on her wrists, the two bracelets on her wrist to my American grandmother when she came to visit, mm -hmm. and it's titled Abe Nadari, which means it's nothing. Like, oh, don't worry, it's nothing. Um, but I did call my dad about three times just to check that my memory of that usage was correct because I could imagine publishing that poem and then getting it totally wrong. So it's right. But yes, I do have a checker as well <laughs> if I really need it. Um, well, do you want to, um, you know, go back? We have a little bit of time left. I think there's two poems more you wanted to read. Do you want to read the yeah, last two? And they, yeah, and they follow on from each other. So the first one wasn't published by Rattle, but it's still online at Acumen. And I wrote it because... Um, when the whole nuclear stuff was going on in the States and whatever you think about it, I just don't know either. But um, when meaning the Iran nuclear deal was happening, everybody wanted to know what I thought about it. And actually what I wanted to say is I, I don't have a, I have a view because my view is so tempered by having family there and having memories of it. Um, and so I keep, I wrote this poem in response to constantly being asked and keep threatening to recite it at people who, um, who asked me. And then I'll just follow on to the second poem, which is a longer poem, which was published by Rattle, which takes the last line of that poem, 
and carries on with it because a year or two years later, people were still asking me when Trump was repealing the nuclear um, deal. And so that was really in response to that. This first one references the last really happy memory I have of Iran, which is my mom taking me swimming in the dark in the Caspian Sea and telling me that there was something she wanted to show me. So you'll hear what it was. So it's called On Seeing Iran in the News, I Want to Say. On seeing Iran in the news, I want to say my grandmother was called Nasreen, that she died two years ago in Tabriz and I couldn't go to say goodbye, that she knew nothing of power, nuclear or otherwise. I want to say that the fires for Chahar Shambay Suri were built by the hands of our neighbors and as children we were taught to jump and not be caught by the flame. I want to say my cousin Elnaz, the one born after I left, has a son and two degrees in chemistry and trouble getting a job. I want to say that the night we swam towards the moon hanging over the horizon of the Caspian Sea, we found ourselves kneeling on a sandbar we couldn't see, like a last gift. I want to say I'm the wrong person to ask. Excellent. And then several, yeah, yeah, several years later, um, I wrote the wrong person to ask. The wrong person to ask. Ask me for the measure of rose water in baklava. How to butter and layer each, sorry, how to butter each layer of phyllo away from the corner, so it holds itself apart under heat, or the exact crush of pistachio, fine as rubble, not yet dust. Ask why the man sitting on our roof in the worst sun of Ramadan refused even a sip of my water, waved it away like a drink offered in rain. Ask about the fountain out back, its patter of stray drops against the sidewalk, the devil's music. Hichi, he'd said, I want nothing. Ask me how to speak one kind of English at school and another at home. Ask about the cherry tree at the bottom of the garden and the only time I remember it in fruit, my father smiling, pulling me from the cleft of its branches in darkness. Ask about the bars on my bedroom window. Ask me how many sugar cubes I could slip into my chai before Mama Bazor noticed. Four. Ask about giving live chicks in a cardboard box as a get well gift for a child with chicken pox. Ask why the baker mixed the dough for barbari in an old claw-footed tub before feeding stretched handfuls into the mouth of the fire. Ask about the army of ants daytimes and the scattering of cockroaches nights, how they fly into dreams. Ask about Khadija and Enola their mud-walled hut squat in our rose garden, tending the Shomal house and their sealed mouths for 25 years. Ask me about chicken soup for a childhood cold, the beheading of a bird for my benefit, the refusal to open my mouth in gratitude. Ask how the grandfather clock of a samovar, its bubble and hiss, marks out time in the house. Ask me how to tarof. How to say no when you mean yes. Ask about my amme, the warmth of her arms around my skinny frame, her language that seeped across my tongue. Ask how I can have forgotten Farsi and the sound of her voice bidding me night after night to sleep, to let the day go. Ask me how to listen. A wonderful poem. Marjorie Latfi, thanks so much for uh, being the guest today. Before we go, let me just um, ask, uh, first of all, you have a pamphlet coming out from Open Book um, that you want. Yeah, there's a yeah. link underneath in the show notes. Can you say a little bit about what that is? And, um, and then one other thing I wanted to ask you about, too. But what is, what is yeah. that first? So that's um, that's the pamphlet of it's out and it's it's of the work coming out of all of our groups across of Scotland. There are poems by women living with domestic violence, refugee and migrants, people living in community projects, homeless um, members of our groups that write together, that write individually, and they all send it all in, and then we get someone else because it's too hard to do it ourselves. 
chooses the work that gets into the pamphlet and it serves as a fundraiser to help fund our work. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just come out just before Christmas, um, put together by my publisher, Tapsal Thierry, um, both Duncan and Eddie there help us out with that. So if you want a copy of it, I think the link is in the chat box, but please do. It's a great way to support us. Yeah, it is. That'd be at openbookreading.com and you can find it under the donate link. Um, and um, yeah, and then the other thing I wanted to ask, just because it's such a wonderful program that you do, is um, if, if there was somebody who's listening now who is thinking about starting the same kind of workshops, um, where, you know, the, um, is there anything advice you can give to, uh, to starting out a project like that if anybody wanted to on their own in their community or whatever? Yeah, well, get in touch with us. You can get in touch with us through the website. All of our emails and contacts are there um, because we could definitely give you some advice on it. It's a really easy very cheap charity to run um, in the sense that, you know, um, depending on the materials you're using, you can usually get them from the library. You can use photocopies and pull them back in for depending on the copyright rules. Um, and you don't really need anything or any space or anything really to run them. So it's a really easy and the, and the level of education is, you know, you don't need anything. You just need to be able to read aloud and ask the right questions. So it's a but it, the, the impact it has on people's lives is huge. Um, so places like libraries, care homes, um, all sorts of all sorts of places that you wouldn't necessarily be able to run a reading group. Libraries is an easy one that you could, but there are all kinds of places that you might think, oh, this would work beautifully. And all you need is someone to turn up and be willing to read aloud. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of people who are able to do that. Um, so yeah, get in touch if you want ideas um, of how to do that. We're, we're we are loving spreading the reading revolution. Uh, we, it's not a it's not something that we're precious about at all. We would love other people to do it. So yeah, we'd love it. Yeah, it's just something that I think you know everybody could do, and it could be a, a, a thing that that just becomes you know something for people to do, other than you know sit home and be on their phones and watching Netflix and things like that. Um, at least once yeah. these uh, lockdowns end. Um, it's definitely something to do it, but you have a podcast, right? For, uh, for open yeah. book. Um, and it's doing the same thing over podcast as I understand it. Yeah. So the idea behind that, when the first lockdown happened, Claire, the other founder and I started a podcast, which is just the two of us basically running a group and you'll see how easy it is because there's no magic, you know, I, and we, we never read the, one of our rules is we never read the work of anyone in the room. Um, so it is not a reading like tonight is, you know, it is us trying to guess what the author meant. And if the author's in the room, it ruins it because you just say, hey, what did you mean by that? And that's the end of that. So um, it's really there is no magic in the sense that there's no magic bullet. There's no secret recipe. It's really a very democratic way to run a group. And everybody's views matter and everybody is right, which is the whole beauty of literature is you can all be right about it and as a writer once you write it and send it out into the world it's everybody else gets to decide what's it what it means so um but we started this podcast so we, they're all on our website in our newsletter you can sign up for our newsletter and every week you'll get a listing of all the groups you can log in from america if you want lots of people brought, log in from all over the world and just join in because they're all on zoom at the minute anyway um, and we'll carry on running zoom groups even after this pandemic is over because we found that we pick up so many people that wouldn't otherwise be able to come people from jamaica people from north way people from all over the place um so yeah you can you can join in our groups but you, claire and i also created a podcast we're now creating them once a month we did in the initial lockdown and they're all there available we did it every week we commissioned writers to write work um that we then read and discussed and paired with poems and it's really just like being in our group mm -hmm. And you'll, if you listen, you'll get lots of inane ba banter about just random things. You probably get to know us. Um, but also you get just he hearing what we think about the story and reading it aloud. So, yeah, yeah. that's all there. Yeah, well, they're really wonderful. You can find all that at openbookreading.com. So find that. And also find more about Marjorie Latfi at, at marjoriegill.com. That's Marjorie, M-A-R-J-O-R-I-E-G-I-L-L.com. Um, thanks so much for being a guest today, Marjorie. Always a pleasure you know, talking to you. It's great so to see for you for me. the first time. Yeah, um, I've known you for yeah. a long time. It's so great to, to put faces to, to names and, and get to know people more in this way. So thanks for being a guest. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for having me and listening to the stories. Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. That may be any time. And for your next book, too, we'll have to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, that was Marjorie Lotfi um, with her newest book refuge which um actually i don't have a physical copy so i'll put it um this back on the screen so you can see what uh, refuge looks like uh, and you can buy it um, just find it at marjoriegill.com and um, now we're gonna take a little one minute break just so i can stretch my legs and um we'll get to the open lines before we do that let me explain how it works 
so we'll have to say goodbye to Marjorie there and put the numbers. But uh, what you do is email a poem to openmic at rattle.com and um, send it there first so that I have it. And then um, call me up at 818-850-7727 over the phone. I'll let it ring a few times, then hang up. And I will just call you back when the time is right. Or you can do it over Skype, which is even better because we can see you. Or you can do it long distance for free. And uh, the Skype ID is Rattle Poetry. Just send me a chat message and I'll call you up when the time is right. We have, um, let's see, a few people lined up so far. Nivedita, Joy Stahl, Richard Westheimer are in so far. Um, the prompt for this week um, was, let me pull it up. And now uh, Carla Schwartz is calling in too. So we'll get Carla on the list. Uh, the prompt for this week was to use randomwordgenerator.com to select three random words. We chose fear, staircase, and passage, but you can do whatever you want and uh, use those in your poem. Um, and that was the prompt. We also had a prompt last week, which is to write an astronaut poem, and we did not have time to get to everybody. So if you want to share your astronaut poem, feel free to do that today or feel free to share whatever you would like. We just love hearing poems and we keep about, uh, you know, 50 minutes or so after the end of these shows for an open mic. So hope you can join us. If you uh, haven't before, please don't be shy and just send the poem first to open mic at rattle.com so I can show it on screen as we go. And I'm going to let you know before I, uh, jet off that next week's guest is going to be um, Alexis Rotella. Uh, her newest book is Dancing the Tarantella. Um, Alexis is a poet we've published frequently. She's another finalist for the Rattle Chapbook Prize this year. Or not Rattle Chapbook Prize. The uh, finalist for the Rattle Poetry Prize. So another poet that you can vote on um, is one of the finalists in the Reader's Choice Award. She's a... Um, uh, writes a lot of uh, tanka and haiban and haiku, and um, she's also the editor of uh, Tanka 2020, an anthology that just came out too. So um, we'll be talking to Alexis Rotella at the regular time, which is Tuesday, January 12th, 9 p.m. Eastern, for Rattlecast number 75. Uh, but we'll be right back right now, just in a minute, with the open mic, just after I stretch my legs for a second and get things set up. So I'll be right back, sending your poems now. We'll do an open mic in just a minute. So I'm back. Thanks so much for uh, your patience and letting me stand up. Uh, sitting in a chair without moving for uh, an hour or two is uh, is tiring all the time. Um, so the prompt, as I said, for this week was to use randomwordgenerator.com to, to uh, come up with three words or to use the three words we used, um, not live on air. We should have done it live on air, but we did it ahead of time. And Megan's poem, let me have my read mine first. Mine was um, pretty short. Um, inspired by Alexis Rotella, I thought I'd write some Tonka because Alexis has, she sent this book, um, Tonka 2020. I don't have the, um, I don't have the doc cam set up right now, but um, Tonka 2020 poems from today's world. Alexis Rotella is the editor in chief of that. And of course, Tonka is a Japanese form um, similar to haiku, but it's five lines. And um, where haiku goes short, long, short, Tonka goes short, long, short, long, long. So it's just, if you do uh, syllables, which I think are too many, it's five seven five seven seven. If you do, uh, I like it more like four six four, because um, because there's more syllables in, in English than uh, than own in Japanese. But uh, here, this is my. I wrote two quick tankas. I thought it was fun. I didn't have much time. It's a busy week, um, getting the spring issue ready in the spring chapbook. So I only had a little bit of time right before the episode, but it was fun writing two little tankas. So here are my. Little Tonka. Um, let me let me make this a little bigger too. 
That's better. Okay, so my first tanka was fear, passage, and, st and uh, staircase. What to fear as evening fades, the passage dimly lit, but still a staircase of stars. So my first tanka. Then I thought I'd just try it again. Hit the random number, the random uh, word generator again. Came up with a new tanka. The words here were sweater, terrace, and keys. And so here's my tanka for those three words. Old sweater, out on the terrace, overnight. Even rain forgets where I left my keys. There you go. That is uh, two quick tankas. And they kind of write themselves. It's actually really, uh, you know, write some tanka and um, send them on to the Tonka 2021 anthology. And that's not a, that's a fun thing to do. And now here's Megan's, um, Megan's poem, which, uh, hiking the day after Christmas. And I can, um, I was here so I can, I can tell you that this is a true story. And also my experience was, uh, it wasn't that cold, but, but Megan gets cold. <laughs> hiking the day after Christmas. When my son trips over a jutting rock, I crouch to hug him. And from my position, I can see the hooves of a dozen deer beneath the blur of branches. See, I tell him, without the fall, we'd miss the deer. Wanting him to believe, I suppose, that life is fair, although I know it isn't true, that life is usually all fall, no deer. But he doesn't need to know everything, not at six, not today, when the gifts at home are shoved aside, naked without their shiny wrappings, and time feels like a passage to a world where joy is as frozen as our fingers in this winter air. With clouds for breath, we climb the wooden staircase to a pond where ducks float, having no sense of time or fairness or fear. Here comes a new year. There are so many things I'll never understand. It gets steep here, I say. Take my hand. That is Megan's uh, prompt poem, Hiking the Day After Christmas. And it really was the day after Christmas. We went for a nice hike down at, um, where was that? It was, I um, can't remember what that valley's called. Down where we go apple picking usually in the, in the fall. We found a fun trail down into a little canyon and uh, decided to check it out. Now, um, let's go on to your poems and see what you have for us. So we have uh, Patricia Rockwood now, Sally Dunn, too. So we have a nice list. But if anybody wants to call in, um, feel, don't hesitate. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot of time because this is an unusual hour for the show. I think the, the live crowd's a little smaller than normal. So there should be plenty of time to get to anybody who wants to share a poem today. So feel free to send it to openmic at rattle.com and then uh, call me up. I'll put the numbers on one more time. 818-850-7727 or Skype to Rattle Poetry, all one word. Um, let's see. Oh, Nivedita says, um, I will not be able to attend the Rattlecast because it streams at 1.30 a.m. in India where she is. Um, she sent a prompt poem. I'm happy if I could read it out loud during the open mic. So I'll do that. Um, she, I think she said that right before bed. So, um, she sent that, uh, a couple hours ago. Okay. Um, let me try to find Nivedita's. I'll read it for her. Um, and this was a prompt to write a poem using Fear, Staircase, and Passage. And it's titled Answers to Life, and it's about the fear that holds us back in life. This poem has not been published. Okay. Um, yeah. Here we go. This is Answers to Life by Nivedita Karthik. Oops, I gotta... Okay. Life is a struggle in which we search for meaning and hope to get through the day. Life is riddled with questions for which we seek answers, but fear always holds us back. The traffic light in our mind, perpetually glowing red, prevents us from seeking the answers. The answers that lie just beyond, beyond the pretty ivy-colored wall, with a dozen diamond-paned windows past the entryway and up the spiral staircase, reaching dizzying heights, probably the reason we wish to stay at the bottom, How, along the passage leading to the balcony. Here, hidden behind one of the doors in this hallway, are the answers we seek, if only we had the courage to look. I love that ending. That was Nivedita Karthik once again with um, Answers to Life. Thanks so much for sharing that, Nivedita. It's always a pleasure to uh, hear your poems and your, your interpretations of our prompts. I really appreciate it. Let's call up. We'll just go in order they were received. And uh, next up is Richard Westheimer. Let's call up Richard and see what he has. I'll see if there's anybody else who wants to um, wants me to read the poem for them. 
Um, okay, here comes Richard. Hey, Tim. Hey, how you doing? Good. Uh, one of the disadvantages of the 30 seconds is I didn't get to hear the end of uh, <laughs> Evita's poem. Um, that interview today, I, I was just blown away by both her reading voice mm -hmm. and and I love the narrative poetry. That was Yeah, she's got a, a great story to tell. It tells it in an amazing way and then reads it in an amazing way, too. She's just a great... Uh, and then it's so, so inspiring what she does with um, all her charity work, too. Those are great, great programs that do so much good. So it's I, I was really happy um, to get to have her on the show today. Yeah, I have her, I have her, her um, website up on my browser to look at after after the open mic is done um and uh very inspiring but but her reading of her poems her poems in her own voice was just incredible yeah yeah definitely i, I was not disappointed i thought it'd be a good episode and it really was um you said yeah. too you had last week's prompt and this week's do you want to read them both um only if there's time i, I think I just, there's gonna I be because this is a you know it's the not the usual time so i think we have i think we don't have to rush at all today so Okay, um, I'll do uh, last week's first since it was last sure, week. Sure, this is I, Astronaut. And, and the prompt, once again, was to um, write a poem called Astronaut or with Astronaut in the title, but not use any space-type words. Yeah. Uh, well, well, specific, specific ones. Space. Yeah, yeah, there was no... Yeah. I can't remember what they were, though, so... <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow, I could have gotten away you, you with could, You could. <laughs> My memory is terrible. I have the wor I have one of the worst memories in the world. Megan can attest to that for sure. Nothing Nothing sticks. <laughs> Well, I've heard you like refer back to poems that you've read, so it's not memory. It's, it's interest or something. Memory for chores yeah. that you're supposed to do around the house. Never mind. <laughs> uh, so I, astronaut, if I could don the blue suit, be weightless in the place between sound and silence, where dark and light embrace swarms of ions fusion illuminated behind a pinpricked veil i'd clear the exosphere and feel like i'm falling descend on some old world new to humans an eden without apples with no tales of gods who choose to turn good fruit into evil to turn good women into pillars of salt I'd land there, remove my blue suit, stretch my arms skyward, listen to the breeze sweep ethereal, gaze through smogless skies, awaken to news of my homelands healed, and then die? It would be enough. But on the radio, I hear mission control remind me that the only reason to go is to return, to tell of what I've seen, to burn bright upon my homecoming, to cry grateful for all I left behind. I think it was Richard Westheimer with I, Astronaut. And um, I, I love that prompt. I thought it was a good one for, I loved all the poems that it generated. It's another good one. Um, just seeing, yeah. seeing where people took the, you know, sort of forced to go in a different direction a little bit. Um, um, so, so the next one, I, I sort of played loose with the rules and I rolled the dice four times. <laughs> And so I took 12 oh, words okay. mm -hmm. um, and I made them, so it's sort of like a golden shovel. I made them the last line, ah. uh, the last word of the first 12 um, um, uh, lines yeah. in my mm -hmm. poems. I, I had to move one to the next line just for poetics reason. And then the last two, I just incorporated as many as I could of those 12. So... Made my own rules. Yes, I like that. It's a, it's a fun uh, fun twist on it, yeah. My father transformed by dying. I sat with him alone in the hospice room. Hours of breathing machine noises made a nap drowse muddle me, almost lose sight of his star receding from here to some galaxy, far from what he was utterly incongruous with the stern man I knew, who was so cool to the touch, would often cite Plato that it was better to think than feel until, until he suffered a private revival upon learning of his cancer, asked me to call him Pop rather than Father, 
his feelings now under siege, he now less a man and more a near naked patient with no room to move but away, become less star and more a small part of an unknown galaxy warm in the night sky. Oh, that was great. The the naked, near naked patient with no room to move but away. That was a great, great poem, great line there. Thanks, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Richard. Th th thanks, thank, thanks for this this open mic and this this tu Tuesday. I look forward to those interviews so much. Awesome. Well, thank, well me too. And, and I appreciate everybody who uh, who watches and participates in the open mic. So thanks for, for being here for us all the time. Good nice shirt, by the way. You got, you guys got the flag going. Yeah, I was going. about to say. <laughs> There are only two that I have resuming, and this one and that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's cold in the office. This is a nice thick one, so I need. It's either that or a sweatshirt in the winter, I think. But <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, well, thanks, Richard. Have a good day. Enjoy. See you yeah, soon. Bye. bye bye. Okay, so that was Richard Westheimer. Um, let's call up. Uh, let me once again. Um, let me give you the numbers. The numbers are eight one eight eight five zero seven seven two seven. If you'd like to call, just call, let it ring a couple times, let it hang up, or uh, send a chat message to Rattle Poetry, all one word. Either way, I'll call you back when it's your turn, and then send the poem to openmic at rattle.com. Um, let me see who is next. Uh, Joy Stahl. Let's call up Joy. And the phone's ringing. I'll try to find Joy's poem as, we, as it rings. I knew I saw it here. It's a long list, though. Let's see. Here it is. If it's the Astro. Jim. Hey. Oh, hang on. I have you. Oh, there you go. Let me uh, let me get this set up a little for one second. Okay, we're good. Sure. So did you want to uh, read the astronaut poem, or did you do a newer one? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, good. I, I did a newer one, but I didn't write it down. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, is it, uh, is it short, too? You could read it if you want. Uh, well, I'm serious. I did not write it down, so I don't know that I even remember it at this point. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you have an astronaut poem, though. So is there anything you want to say yeah. about it before you read? Uh, well, just to say that the uh, idea of doing it as an acrostic was just to get the creativeness going, and then I decided I liked it the way it was. So. Yeah, yeah, good idea. Okay, so here it goes. So it's an acrostic, uh, which means the uh, the first letter of each line spells out astronaut. So go ahead whenever you're, you want, yeah. Joy. Astronaut, a child's dream, shoot through the clouds to escape velocity. Robots on board, Orion Nebula in sight, nervous yet excited. Atmosphere encapsulated, up, up and away toward distant galaxies. Excellent. Thanks so much for that. Was Astronaut by Joy Stahl. Thanks, Joy. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Okay. Let me see. So we have. Um... We have a few people too. I think. Um, let's see what we have. So Gail Sosinski. Um, I'm not sure if Gail's here, um, but um, Sally Dunn. We have a poem for. I think some people. Let's see. Um, oh, Vicky Miko. I'll read Vicky's. And uh, well, Carlton Johnson here has one too. So I'll read a few. After uh, we call up whoever is next, which is... Oh, Vicky Miko's going to call in, too. Let's call up Sally Dunn. Or no, let's call up Carla Schwartz. Carla's next, then Sally. And Sharon Ferrante has a poem, um, too. Hi. Hey, Carla, how are you doing I'm today? Just, I'm good. I'm just going to turn the thing down. Okay, okay. I'm okay. here. So how are you doing? Um, I am doing very well, thank you. It's uh, kind of snowing here on the East Coast, and it's lovely wintry evening kind of time. Yeah. And, uh, so you can hear me, right? Yeah, I can definitely hear it. Yeah. Um, did you want to do your astronaut poem, or was there a newer yeah. one? Okay, okay. No, I'm just going to do the astronaut poem. Okay, so this is astronaut. And, yeah. Yeah. And it's called Astronaut. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> And um, I guess while you're looking, I'll tell you something about it, which is that it's, it is based uh, in truth, a true story of something from when I was a kid. And then also my understanding always when I was a young adult and older that supposedly you couldn't be an astronaut if you didn't have 
you know, perfect vision, perfect hearing, and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So this is called Astronaut. Okay, whenever you're ready, I have it. When I crossed the street, my blue umbrella hooked between my fingers, Gina not caring that I didn't show at her house while her mother cooked cornbread in the kitchen, I was excited to bring the umbrella that I might drop in like Mary Poppins from the sky as I stepped into the street. The steel grill, a Chevy, a brand new Nova kissed my ear, smacked my head, ejected me to land in a sea of our driveway. All we knew at first, I couldn't stand up, couldn't walk. Later, knowledge of damaged nerves emerged. A capsule in the ocean at three. How could I know a car could do that? Steal my hearing, keep me from becoming an astronaut. Oh, wow. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, great story, Carla. Um, thanks so much for sharing it. Oh, thank you so much, Tim. Take care. And this is a great afternoon. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. And that was uh, Carla Schwartz. Uh, you can find Carla, of course, at CB99 Videos. So if you see any comments on YouTube, um, that's Carla. That's her YouTube channel, CB99 Videos. So follow her there or the same at YouTube and Twitter and all that. Um, let me read Carlton Johnson's poem next. Then we'll call up, um, we have Vicky Miko, Patricia Rockwood, Sally Dunn, and um, we'll do some more. So let's see, uh, let's read carlton johnson's poem for the open mic let me uh, uh pop it into a document really quick this was um the word generator and oops, carlton's poem or carlton's words were a bathroom drawing and cookie but let me just uh put this in a in a word so i can size it right and stuff there we go so here comes, uh, this is Carlton Johnson, Sometimes My Life, with his own three words. Um, move this over. There we go. Sometimes in my, or sometimes my life, in the morning particularly, is full of breath, breathing in and out, sighing and aspiring, getting up and getting on, longing to get on with it, drawing out a long, thin strand of hope. Today, for example, in the lonely little tomb of a bathroom, I stood on the scale and pondered, am I the curve, the line, or the drawing of width versus the girth? Would I may or may not contrive to strive ahead, yearning for leaner worth? Later, I befriended my appetites when I spied and ate the last oatmeal raisin cookie on a white china plate, so good and so fresh, the sort Grandma Kay used to make. Be kind to yourself, she used to say. Too late, I say to myself, wiping crumbs from my upturned lips. That was Carlton Johnson with Sometimes My Life. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carlton. Um, let's see. Let's call up next Sally Dunn. And uh, Sally's got The Weakness of Stone. Hey Sally, how are you doing today? Doing okay. And you have a you have a random word generator poem, and you added an extra word or two words. Yeah, you switched well, it a little I, bit. What, what <laughs> happened is I I wrote the, I did the word generator thing, and I came up with three words: um, clean, uh, hey, hey uh, uh, Sally, I don't know if you can hear me. You're breaking up. I'm going to hang up and call you right back. Maybe that'll work. Okay. Yeah, sometimes there's a weird connection. We'll try it again. Maybe get a better one. Hey, Sally, you there now? Uh, it's still very, very uh, choppy. Say something so I can see if we can hear you. Um, yeah, I can't really. It's come in so choppy that we can't really do it. But I'm just going to read your poem for you. Okay, so uh, here we go. Um, we'll just read Sally's poem for this is uh, the weakness of stone, and she I think she was saying that um, 
she did the random generator and picked some other words. So she has cunning and abbey in addition to staircase and passage. And so Sally's poem was the weakness of stone. And let's, uh, let's hear it here. The weakness of stone. Only the insane step into the abbey that some cunning lord or king crushed for a land of gold, for land and gold. I'm not afraid as I look down into darkness. I don't trip on bits of stone and dead leaves as I descend the staircase. I walk forward to prove and prove again. I am not afraid to stand where priests and brothers were killed. At the end of the passage of the dead, I lift my hand to touch the stone and watch it slip through. I'm not afraid as I poke my head through to see what comes after. I'm not afraid as I pause with one foot through the wall. Another excellent poem. Uh, that was The Weakness of Stone by Sally Dunn. Thanks so much, and sorry that the, the phone call was too choppy for you to read it yourself, Sally. I'm uh, not sure what, um, you know, maybe just some cell tower problem or something. Um, let's call up Patricia Rockwood next. And we'll see, uh, we'll see what we have for Patricia. This is Fears, a prompt poem for today. Hey, Patricia, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, we can't see yet, though. Can you, do you want to um, um, click your camera button yeah. or, uh, or just keep audio? Um, oh, there it is. Okay. I found it. Perfect. I think you're coming in now. Okay. I think. Oh, okay. you're still not there. Oh. No, but that's okay. We can just do audio. Oh, okay. there you come. Hello. <laughs> Just took a while to, to set up. Okay. Uh, so, so how are you doing today, Patricia? I'm good, thanks, Tim. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, and you had fears, and this is uh, this is from the prompts. From the, yes. um, is there anything you want to say about it, or do you just want to jump in? Um, no, I just want to jump in. Okay. And I have an astronaut poem. If you, we've got time for that. Oh sure, yeah, I think we do. It's only uh, it's only we're ninety seven minutes in, so we've got plenty of time. Yeah, yeah, I'll find back after uh, after you read fears. Okay, fears. Don't touch the stove. Look both ways before crossing the street. Don't talk to strangers. Duck and cover. Your so-called scary movies are Dollsville now, with so many things to fear. What's one more creaky staircase? Another dark passage? Those tired tropes are old hat compared to the stealth fighter of this virus coming in low and silent behind us, all around us. Don't look now. Stand back six feet, wear a mask, get a tent. Excellent. Thanks. That was Fears for I, Patricia Rockwood. Thanks so much for sharing that. It's a great advice right now, too, is the, is the winter, the dark winter is coming, um, or is here already, I guess. More, uh, me, more advice for all our lives, yeah, right? Yeah. And then the astronaut poem, um, I'll get that up, too, um, from last week. Go ahead. Whenever you're ready with that, I'll, I'll have it up. All right. And this one, um, for some reason, I started out a metaphor with I just started thinking about astronaut as a metaphor for a failed relationship. Uh, so, astronaut. Your orbits are far flung. Your long loop lasts a heartbeat longer, eking out a measly extra thump behind my breath. One circuit and you're home, scorched earth and ash. The next you're gone a faint contrail to mark your exit. How can I plot your next trajectory, calibrate this widening gyre? Not with charts, I'm all thumbs. Hopeless at numbers, I can only point my compass in the general area of the constellation of regret. Excellent, that was Astronaut by Patricia Rockwood. Thanks so much for sharing that, Patricia. Always a pleasure. Yep, Thank bye. you. Okay, that was Patricia Rockwood. Um, let's see. Let's try. Oh, Vicky Miko can make it today. Let's try to get in touch with Vicky. Hey, Vicky, how you doing today? Uh oh. Oh, I, I heard you. I think you can't hear me again. 
Uh, sir. Yikes. Can you hear me? No, I think not. I... Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I think that, that happens with, with Vicky's thing. I'm not sure why. Um, but I think I will... Uh, I'll just read Vicky's poem for her. Sorry, Vicky. Um, maybe if you want to do, we could do a test call just me and you sometime and try to figure out what that issue is. So then, uh, then you can be on and participate. Um, but let's see. So, oh, there's another beautiful, um, this is, uh, haiku with three words, fear, passage, staircase. So she kind of went in the same direction ish I did going for the short form poems. And, um, this is a picture, um, uh, Vicky says, I took this picture behind one of the garden outbuildings at the haunted Winchester Mystery House. I want to go there so bad. I've never been, though, in uh, in uh, San Jose, California. And uh, this is a photo that Vicky took. And uh, this is the haiku. Um, Her adolescent fear, a marked passage under the staircase. Oh, and look at that. There is a, there's a ladder there. And... Um, and then a secret passage underneath, if you can see that. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful haiga. Thanks so much for, for sharing that, Vicky. Always a pleasure. Um, and let's see. Um, here's something. This is Jose Gonzalez sent this in and asked me to read this. Um, the line breaks. I'm not sure if the line breaks just didn't show up or if it's a prose poem. This is Jose Gonzalez's interpretation of the fear staircase passage prompt <clears throat> let me let me pull it up over here for you okay here we go i have fear i'm afraid so what makes me human all the tough talk and bravado is to impress whom again this life this passage is littered with so many traps and obstacles i don't want to give i don't want to give up I don't want to quit no matter what happens, but sometimes it seems it is the only option. I use the staircase to get upstairs to reach the penthouse suite. The elevator is undergoing repairs. Oh, I love that ending. A great run-on rush of a poem there. Uh, once again, that was Jose Gonzalez. Thanks so much for sharing that, Jose. Always a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Let us see. Is there anybody? Let me see if we have anybody else to share. We got Nibby. It's the, the part of the show where it's hard to see who I called already and who I didn't. Um, okay, let me see if there's any other poems to read here. Ah, okay. So Maribade Carr um, says, please read if you can. I have a new baby in Canada. Congratulations on your new baby, Maribade. And uh, let me, this is the astronaut. I'll put this into a uh, a Word doc again really quick. This is the astronaut prompt from last week by uh, Maribade Carr. And uh, let's do this one, The Astronaut. The Astronaut. You join us in bed at 6 a.m., look out the window for 20 minutes, pull the blanket down. We forget to replace. Take your red tricycle outside, always swerving out into the street. And on the way back, you stand up. Look up, your thoughts wandering outwards. A string... I string you back home somehow. You soak the warm bath with closed eyes. Fidget into bed eventually, eyes wide and weighted. They lift the heavy load of tomorrow. They hold out for changes outside the window. The blanket finally falls until you jump at the first torch of light again. It was Mara Bade Carr with the astronaut. I love that, the heavy load of tomorrow. What a great phrase that was. Um... Let us see what else we have. There just there were so many last week um, that uh, we didn't get to. So let me do some of these more. Here's another astronaut poem. This is Mike Bales, Unspace. Yeah, get this for everybody too. Unspace by Mike Bales. The astronaut in a spaceship approaching the black hole cannot describe the void indicated by instruments. He cannot say star or stardust, for it consumes all light, and light he cannot use to describe this voided sight. Though an infinite mass, this great being says that really it is nothing at all. 
When the skin is cut, it heals without a scar, and it can consume a lesser one with a minor change in shape. Signs say the universe has created the perfect whole, a verse of mystery calling beyond mere mortal sight. It was Unspaced by Mike Bales. And um, let me see. Let's hold some others for uh, for next week, I think. Oh, Eva's asking me to read, too. This is uh, Eva Zimmet. Did we do this yesterday? Let's do Eva Zimmet's, too, the astronaut. Maybe I should do... I'll, I'll do as many of the astronauts as I can, just because, you know, some people wrote them, and, um, you know, we'd like to share them. So here's The Astronaut by Eva Zimmet. And uh, here we go. Astronaut. Yes, thanks. I would like that. I would like to be described as a singularity, an undefined point that ceases to be well-behaved mathematically as a singularity I share area. But meander and frolic and flirt on the horizon of events. Who are you to say I don't? You can't see me anyway, although by all accounts I am not undetectable, just unruly and very, very powerful. Approach me, will you? Know me, will you? I trust you to believe that, to thrive on curiosity, as you say, but what you do is list properties, call them yours, and sign your name. Another excellent poem. A great, great ending there. People keep coming up with great endings on this prompt. Um, well, I think that is going to be the show for today. Make sure I didn't... Oh, I, I missed... Uh, uh, Sharon Ferrante has one here. And um, she can't come on Skype either. So this is a new prompt poem. And this is a Nivedita's Smile. So um, let me see what she says about this. this is a, it's a prompt poem. I want to write about Nivedita. Her smile just makes me feel so good. So I put them together. And uh, here's Sharon Ferrante with uh, Nivedita's Smile. I scry into the fire seeing nothing until the resin shapes a heart on the glass door. Then it travels like a genie bottle, atop temples, crossing oceans without fear, too wide is the light not to be granted passage, becoming still life in minds who remember the feeling when the top of the staircase is reached. What is it with the last lines? These are great, great endings everybody's doing. Um, so I think, let me, I'm gonna make sure I get as much as I can. Um, oh, here's Kathy Gibbons' astronaut poem. Okay, we got to make this the last one, I think. We actually are running out of time now as I've, as I've pulled these older poems back up from last week that we missed. Um, this is I Fly Number 1 by Kathy Gibbons. I Fly Number 1. When I saw that man emerge from the Gulf of Mexico and walk along the shore, one red foot to ankle boot, I thought some posh equipment for his sporting of kite surfing. Like a merging of his foot in its red glove to the body of the board. But then I saw that it was blood, ankle high and pulsing down to the toe and sand, a fashionable match for the color of his shoot. How rep representative, all perforated yet still game, for what the world, the waves and wind had to offer him. High-flying, somersaulting, catapulting from the sea, the gash, another notch on his to-do list, a poof of something, a way to tempt the world and bring it into play. Blood was fancy dressing for his feet. That was Kathy Gibbons with I Fly, number one. Thanks so much for sharing that, Kathy. Um, okay, so that is definitely going to be the show for today. Everybody, thanks so much. I had a blast. Uh, Marjorie Lotfi was a wonderful guest. And um, a whole bunch of fun. Let me pull up next week's prompt. And I forgot where I put it. Okay, here. So next week's prompt is a, is a short one. And it is going to be... A Circus with No Audience. That's next week's prompt. A Circus with No Audience. And um, very open-ended, but it sort of gives you a place to start. And you can do any kind of poem you want. A circus with no audience. I already have something in mind. Uh, hopefully I'll have time to write it. And uh, hopefully you will too. So you can call in and share it on the open mic as always. And next week's guest, like I already said, is going to be Alexis Rotella. Um, Alexis is the author most recently of Dancing the Tarantella. Uh, but she is the author of many books and anthologies, uh, mostly in the haiku community. 
Um, she's a, a writer of Haibun and Tonka and Tonka prose and haiku. And she is a finalist for the 2020 Rattle Poetry Prize. It's a, it's a Haibun uh, that she wrote there. So if anybody subscribers can go check that out. Uh, we don't have any poems of her online or I would have read one today, but looking forward to sharing that next week and then uh, on the website soon. That is Alexis Rotella, Rattlecast number 75, Tuesday, January 12th at the regular time next week, 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday. There's actually some day left for me. Daylight's out now. That's unusual. Have a good one. Goodbye.